the first 50 folks uh, from this podcast that go to modernrevenuestrategies.com slash free download. I'll give them the full book. All right, welcome back to Gaining the Technology Leadership Edge. And today, my guest is Mark Osborne, founder of Modern Revenue Strategies. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks so much, Mike. It's a real pleasure to be here. So uh, tell me about Modern Revenue Strategies. You know, what is it? What do you do there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we work with building revenue systems. So marketing, sales, customer success, really all of those sources of revenues, uh, bringing together to create systems uh, for early stage companies in the SaaS, B2B services, technology sector uh, to grow their revenues, grow their client base by attracting the right prospects, accelerating those opportunities through the sales pipeline, and then activating existing clients for renewals, upsells, referrals. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be with you here because what we have seen is so much of the marketing landscape uh, and even sales and customer success is now really dependent on data sources and the technology to make sense of, of that data. So we see that a lot of marketers uh, at these companies, even early stage companies, have to be as much of a technologist uh, as they do a marketer. Uh, and in fact, I, I've been really heavily involved with using data and technology to make sense of that data uh, for marketing purposes. In fact, in 2017, Ad Age Magazine named me a marketing technology trailblazer. So they said I was one of the top 25 people in the world at using data and technology to uh, leverage on, on behalf of marketing. So it's something that I'm really passionate about and uh, excited to talk to your audience about today. Yeah, congratulations on that award. That's a, that's a uh, great honor. So how do you feel, how important do you feel automation is uh, in the marketing process? Yeah, so vitally important, uh, particularly for early stage companies uh, that can get bogged down in sort of manual processes. However, uh, I'm a big believer that systems set you free. Uh, and this is sort of part of my approach. Systems lend themselves well to automation. But one of the things that we do see companies uh, get distracted by is this sort of idea of chasing a silver bullet or a growth hack or some way to game the algorithm that's going to you know magically make their business double what we really see is it's you know foundations and strategic approaches to the marketplace that then guide the creation of systems that then guide the implementation of data to enhance that technology to enhance that or automate that that's the real key to success for businesses is building that process and, and building that system that's scalable and, and can grow, and then layering in the technology that makes it faster, makes it more reliable, takes out uh, you know, sort of human error or you know, kind of manual input. That's the real key. Rather than, and, and I'm sure you've uh, seen this happen a lot in your experience, people find a shiny new toy and then they go around looking for places to, to shoehorn it in. Uh, and that's not really a recipe for success. In fact, that can be a recipe for disaster. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, I've seen people, my own clients, um, you know, I, I spend time these days coaching uh, CTOs and my own clients will have like a massive um, system of automation in place. And then they're wondering, like, I didn't expect that to happen, you know, and they make <laughs> it so complicated that um, they miss the glitches in the system until someone tells them about it. That's right. Um, I mean, even even this podcast, you know, I have an automated booking process that pretty much takes you through the whole thing. But anytime I get a new notice that, OK, someone's in here, I make sure that every step worked and, you know, that kind of thing, because it's not as complicated. That's so right. what what kind of what kind of systems like, like automation systems do you recommend people take advantage of that aren't like shiny object syndrome type uh, systems? Well, I mean, there's a lot of tried and true things uh, and. You know, the, the, real, the real balance is where do you need customization? Where can you use customization, though, empowered by technology within human oversight? Uh, and, and what we see today, and obviously, chat, G, G, chat GPT and all this generative AI is getting a lot of buzz. It's really just because it's more conversational. It's not really much more sophisticated. Uh, I have seen on the marketing front, People sort of err to the side of, oh, there's this tool now that just does it. Um, and, and so there's a, you know, there are tools out there that will 
scrape LinkedIn profiles and use that to create sort of personalization. It's not always right though. Uh, and so, you know, there's, you know, there's the, the time where they're like, congratulations on the recent death of your father, because they scraped, you know, the, the latest comment that the, that someone made uh, and then jammed it into a, uh, a personalization. That, so all of those things are still at the point where they need human oversight. Um, but that's kind, of, the, that, that, that's kind of humorous because it's it's actually more embarrassing than the common one everyone sees, which is hi first name. Right, you know, exactly. Like that. I mean, I, I think it would be I would be mortified if I saw an email from that went out from me that said congratulations on the death of your father. Like, yeah. Well, well and, and those examples exist. Like they're happening today. Sure. Um, the but and, and then the other thing too is you know. Are you really trying to create scale or are you trying to uh, sort of remove the hum human element of error? Uh, and, and one of the things that I really encourage my clients to do is to create systems that ensure you're always your best self. So, uh, you know, a system is designed to capture what is an A plus delivery look like, whether that's as part of a, a sales interaction or a marketing interaction or a customer success or a deliverable uh, and then use automation and use technology to ensure that you're making that happen rather than using technology that makes you your worst self as many times as possible, uh, which is what a lot of these sort of uh, automations or, you know, sort of scale oriented technology solutions are designed to really designed to do is to sort of water down the, the value of you um, and but then just spread it out to a lot of people. So everybody, you know, everyone who listens to the show, they, they understand uh, advertising. And sure. so one of the you know, big things people rely upon is say like the Facebook pixels for, sure. for retargeting and whatnot. Um, what do you predict will happen now though, that like companies like Apple, you know, they're locking down on the privacy issues. What, what do you see as the future of advertising now that that's happening? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of companies that are reliant on, you know, third-party platform pixels. Uh, I've worked with companies that make substitutes uh, for that type of solution. I've published a few articles on this. So there, there's really two ways forward, I'll, and then I'll and then I'll describe what I think is likely to happen. Way forward one is essentially pixel substitutes. So using other pseudonymous, pseudo anonymous identifiers. Um, companies are creating a replacement for the pixel uh, that uh, will do a lot of the same things. And it's using backend uh, connections in, you know, in apps or in uh, the publisher platforms to capture identifiers, to match that across the ecosystem. Um, and and that's, that's a very popular approach. Um, and then the other approach is to move to more permission-based. So it's sort of using a panel that represents um, the, the sort of population of interest, but they've all sort of expressly given their permission to be tracked uh, and, and it either installed some code in their you know, browser or it allowed that backend integration. Um, where will it go? I don't know, but I have a, a belief on which is better. Uh, and my belief on which is better is permission-based panels. And the reason is these sort of pixel replacement uh, or substitution solutions, fundamentally, they work better than pixels at, at times at, you know, sort of linking across the ecosystem or uh, for, you know, tracking the behavior or even sort of scoring the user uh, in such a way uh, that, that makes them more susceptible to advertising or more targetable or all of those things. However, the reason that cookies are going away, the reason that Apple uh, implemented the you know, tracking policy was about privacy. Uh, and these sort of pixel replacement solutions fundamentally skip the privacy mandate. Uh, whereas, and, and then they also introduce a lot of selection bias because you can't generate one of these identifiers for everyone in the world. And there's this sort of false belief that you can using you know, IP address or, you know, other markers on a mobile device and on a, a browser, and all those things. There's this sort of false belief that you can track them all the same way, you know, 80% of cookies are only seen once. Uh, and so like, it, there was this belief that everyone was trackable with cookies. That's not really true. 
this cookies replacements, it's not really capturing everyone. So there's the sampling bias that's created. Whereas within a permission-based panel, you can get much more robust information about the panelists. And then you can use that information to balance um, the inputs so that you can say, well, we're missing sample from adults, you know, or males in the 45 to 50 age range from this particular zip code. So then you can balance that out to get a much more representative picture of the marketplace. Well, then it sounds like you don't think a lot of, there's a lot of naysayers out there who think, you know, doomsdayers who say, oh, you know, it's the end of advertising as we know it. And I mean, I, I've never been a believer in that. So like now, now that brings me to a point of, you know, so people use advertising to generate leads. Um, what kind of struggles are you seeing out there with lead generation? So for sure, the, you know, Apple removing that tracking really limited Facebook's ability to optimize um, against particular audiences. And, and that's where the core of Facebook's capability. That said, they're, they still have access to a lot of data uh, and they still have a very, you know, sort of strong algorithm for optimization. The challenge that we see for a lot of, especially in the B2B space is you're trying to target a really tight niche. Uh, and that's not how Facebook's algorithm is built. Their algorithm for targeting is built on lots of data. So they need you essentially to target everybody and spend a bunch of money and give them time uh, to find those people that are going to engage. And, and they will do it. The house always wins. Like the, if you give it enough time uh, and, and, and data to feed their algorithm, they'll drill in. But that time and cost uh, is prohibitive for a lot of early stage companies. And so what we see as a, as a much more effective strategy, and in fact, we see sort of 10x improvements on investments when you, when you go this route is to really take the time to understand your ideal customer profile, the buyer personas of your champions, decision makers, influencers within that sales process. And then what does their customer decision journey look like? Like, wh how do they go from being aware that this is a problem they could solve to prioritizing it as a problem they're going to solve this year to evaluating different ways to solve the problem and then evaluating different vendors that solve it in that way? How do, where do they go to find that information? It's probably not Facebook. Uh, but if you, really understand that journey and the informational needs they have at each stage of that journey, then you can find where they are uh, and engage with them in a way that's much more authentic, much more powerful, and much less expensive oftentimes uh, than the same number of exposures on, on Facebook or Instagram or, or wherever it might be. And so that taking the time to really do that can can be can really pay off in uh, dividends and sort of the efficiency of your advertising. I've often felt that like from an when you try to do organic outreach, that one of the reasons why so many people use LinkedIn for that is that you can kind of look under the hood at someone and see you know what is it that they're into, um, you know who are they connected with, what types of people are they connected with, and Facebook not so much because people can kind of do whatever they want. However, and we all know that. They track every click you do, what you watch, what videos you watch, how long you watch them, how often you watch them. And I often thought, you know, it'd be interesting in their business manager if they just had a tool that you could say, this is the kind of person I'm looking for. Where am I going to find them on your platform? You know, what groups are they active in? You know, that'd be a little hint. Yeah. But and it would help. You, you what are your thoughts on that? You can do that, but not as transparently as you're, you're asking for. And, and the way that a lot of advertisers do that is they build an email list of their core, of their ideal customer profile, their tier one customers. If you then upload that list uh, to Facebook and then say, find me more people like this, they'll do it. They won't tell you where they found them. They won't say, well, it turns out they're all fans of Star Wars original trilogy, but uh, but actually they're using things like that uh, to pinpoint them. I actually worked uh, back in 2014. So this was before Instagram even took ads uh, for a company that had the fire hose of data coming out of Twitter and Facebook, and then was using machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict response to ads based on uh, sort of their engagement with different content. And we found really interesting things like people that are fans of the original Star Wars trilogy respond to this particular technology solution. 
uh, and, and some sort of non-intuitive uh, sort of ways for targeting. Uh, and that's what that platform was designed to do. But Facebook is doing that behind the scenes. They just don't make it as transparent. That's interesting because one of the things that I've done that actually increased um, my success rate quite a bit was on LinkedIn. If I post it, if I post something manually to LinkedIn, so I don't use a scheduling tool set, yep. Yep. it will say, hey, people in this group might be interested in this kind of content. I make a note of that. And then if I start to see that group recommended a lot, I'm going to make my foray into that group and find out what's going on in there. You know, um, it's not exactly high tech, but I'm using their suggestion engine kind of against them to figure out where these people are hiding. I have a theory about that. So I see that same thing. My theory, though, is that they're recommending the groups that aren't as active because they're wanting you to go in and then stimulate activity within those groups. And in some ways, like a lot of the streaming services, you know, they kind of recommend to me stuff that other people aren't watching. I think just because they're trying to like pull me deeper into the content, they know I'm going to find the hits. Uh, and so they recommend the obscure stuff. Sometimes I wonder if the LinkedIn algorithm is doing that. I don't, I don't have any evidence to this. This is just a, a personal theory of mine. I think you're mostly right about that because many, many times when I have heard the same recommendation like five times and I go in and I check it out, it's like the last three posts there were mine. That, right. <laughs> you know, that like, kind of thing. <laughs> and a lot of the other B2B marketers that that I work with, there's there's a reference that um, you know, the the groups on LinkedIn are oftentimes that you know they call them graveyards uh because they're filled with zombies. Uh, and those zombies are basically, they may not be bots, but they're people that are just there to say, buy my resume writing service, buy my resume writing service. And it's just, it's, it's, so it's a graveyard filled with zombies oftentimes. However, what they, what people see as, as a much more uh, appropriate way to engage with people on LinkedIn is find the hashtags uh, that people are using and, and even find your ideal customer profile and that persona or avatar of the person you want to talk to. And what are the hashtags they're talking about? Uh, and then look at other people that are talking about those same hashtags. And that's often a better way in uh, to the conversation than uh, those groups. Yeah. And I, I've, I've seen, that's an interesting piece of advice because I've seen that before where someone, someone in a course said, Think about your ideal customer and if you were creating a LinkedIn profile for them, what would it say? What would their what would their headline say, et cetera? And then look for those kinds of people. Uh, and you know, chances are you're gonna find the right people. So let's let's talk a little bit about like in marketing these days. Um, and I and I'm sure it's always been this way, but it, I've only been paying attention to marketing really for like the last five, six years. Um, storytelling plays a huge role. Um, what what are your thoughts on on that? Like just using storytelling to attract the right customer. Absolutely. So, I, you know, I, I'm a believer that we have millions of years of evolution leaning on us. That, that the most efficient and effective way to communicate for most of the existence of uh, Homo sapiens was storytelling. Uh, and that's the way we said, here's where the water is. Here's where the food is. Here's yeah. where the danger is. Here's how to get back home. Uh, and and storytelling was that uh, that vehicle for communicating information, and so it still is today, whether we like it or not. And in fact, you know, working in uh, marketing technology and working with data, that sort of storytelling with data is oftentimes missed. Of you know, well, what does it really mean? Uh, and and that ability to really sort of understand that story is powerful. And, and I, I use a framework uh, with my clients of, you don't want to be, you know, there, there's this concept of the hero's journey. I'm sure you've heard of that. Yep. You know, most, most, you know, popular movies will follow some type of hero's journey framework. And a lot of brands will then sort of adopt that and be like, here's our hero's journey. But uh, instead, you want your customer to be the hero. You're the, uh, you as the, the brand want to be the, uh, the Obi-Wan to their Luke. Uh, you want to be the guide that takes them through this journey of transformation uh, so that they then, you know, realize the benefits. And that's, it's that framing uh, and then using evidence along the way to sort of show how you've 
created this transformation for your clients uh, along the way. And then where you can intersperse logical elements, some uh, logos to go with the, you know, the ethos and pathos. That's how you, you know, sort of help people through that decision making uh, journey. There's an old, there's an old saying that all decisions are based, are made based on emotion, but then justified with logic. And I think that's largely true, even in B2B, where people think that they are, oh, I'm only making a decision based on the logic. A lot of times you can't know what it's like to work with vendor A versus vendor B until you've been a customer for two years. Yeah. Uh, and so you have to make a decision based on what do you feel is going to be the difference? Because on paper, they can be very similar to each other. Uh, and, and we forget oftentimes in B2B marketing that it's a person on the other end that's making that decision. Uh, and so appealing to that sort of ethos and, and pathos, like bringing in that emotion, um, it, it can be powerful as long as you don't rely on it exclusively and you have to be authentic. Uh, there, there's no worse thing for a business than to bring in a customer uh, through, you know, sort of deception because they're going to require you to customize your product too much. They're going to require extra uh, customer support. They're not going to renew. They're not going to provide testimonials. And, and those are really the kind of customers that kill your business instead of growing your business. Well, and like to your point about differentiating between two potentially equivalent vendors, right? Um, my wife and I recently went to a, a barbecue festival and you know, we paid money to, to, ta to do taste testing. And then we we're supposed to vote. Okay. And one of the big mistakes my wife felt was like they were they were pushing ribs, chicken, and a, and like a side dish like mac and cheese or cornbread or something. But you only got one of those items when you gave them a ticket. And she said it would have been smarter if they made the portion size smaller. And yeah. here's why she said that: you try someone's ribs from part from booth A, then you go to booth B, and you're like, wow, they taste about the same. Like they're really good. How do I pick which one's the winner? Well, maybe you know if you were going to go to a restaurant, you'd probably go to the one where the ribs and the side dish were really good That's right. versus the one where the ribs are really good, but the side dish wasn't so good. I mean, why would you pay the money? Right. So I think that that's an interesting point about marketing. Like the story is going to connect the customer to the, to the brand. And then that tells them, well, you know what? I really like what brand a says more than what brand B says. So I'm going to go with them. Um, that's but right. you know, a little birdie told me that you wrote a book. So I did. Um, tell, tell me about your book. The first 50 folks uh, from this podcast that go to modernrevenuestrategies.com slash free download, I'll give them the full book, uh, sort of connects to what we were just talking about, which is this idea of, you know, being inauthentic and chasing the wrong customers um, is, is really sort of uh, creates this death spiral for business. And, and a lot of B2B companies, especially in the technology space, they're obsessed with more leads, more leads, more leads. Uh, but what we have seen over the last 20 years and generating tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars for clients is um, if you're not attracting the best uh, opportunities, the best leads that are most aligned with your long term product and buying vision, your competitors are. And then you're sort of stuck fighting for the scraps. And the, what makes those scraps so bad is. They don't believe in your long-term vision for where the market is heading. And so as a result, they don't really see the value in your product. They want discounts. They want you to make customizations. They want you to build something for them, which isn't really what the marketplace wants. And so now you're building a product for one customer that is sort of the only one you have, or you're only able to get access to these customers that are all sort of divergent. Whereas, and again, going back to systems, if you build the systems that take your product vision and buying vision out to the marketplace in a really compelling way, you'll attract those prospects that understand your long-term vision, that buy into where you think the market is going and why your approach is the best approach. Those are the opportunities that sell themselves. They move faster through that sales cycle. They don't ask for as many discounts. They see the long-term benefit for, uh, from it. And then they also are willing to renew and uh, increase their engagement with you and, and buy more from you because they understand where you're going. And they're even willing to be testimonials or referrals for you. And so if you are attracting those right opportunities and then using data and technology and systems to identify those right opportunities when they come in and focus 
80% of your efforts there instead of you know being distracted by the other 80% of opportunities that are going to be sort of bad leads. That's how you really create success in the marketplace. If you're not using systems or data and technology to identify those best opportunities, then you get caught in this death spiral of chasing the bad leads that are going to just distract you from the marketplace. Um, but the book has been really well received and uh, a lot of technology and uh, B2B SaaS companies that we work with have really found a lot of value from it. For your listeners, I'm actually going to uh, give them a little offer if you if you want me to put that out there. Yes. Yeah. So the first 50 folks uh, from this podcast that go to modernrevenuestrategies.com slash free download, I'll give them the full book. And with that will come a number of templates, calculators, other tools they can use to build things like their ideal customer profile, their customer avatar, to map out the customer journey uh, so that they can save all that money on advertising by finding those uh, good ways to impact that informational journey. Uh, and there's even hours of uh, training videos that come with it uh, as part of sort of an email course that comes with the download. So uh, for your first uh, 50 listeners that uh, go to modernrevenuestrategies.com slash free download, uh, we'll provide that book for them. Oh, thank you for that. Make sure you guys take advantage of that. You know, it's interesting what you said, you know, in like the concept of leads killing your business, because like my wife and I, we run multiple businesses. And I would have to say, I was on a podcast recently and they asked me, what's the biggest lesson you've learned that's helped make your businesses a success? And it really was, I don't have to work with everybody. That's right. I only have to work with the people that fit. And, you know, I mean, I told them the story of, you know, early on, my wife was running a virtual assistant agency and she had a client who was not paying her very much, driving her crazy, demand, very demanding. And she finally got the nerve to fire him. I'm not working with you anymore. And literally replaced him with an identical client with the same number of hours at triple the rate. That's right. Uh, and never hasn't has had that client now for five years and hasn't looked back. Um, learning learning who you should be working with is key to everything else that you do. It appears. I mean, down to the you know your day to day. Because they're the ones who are going to, the ones who you shouldn't be working with are the ones who are going to ask you for the discounts and question yep. every minute of your invoice um, versus those who they kind of see your vision. They're, yep. they're going to come up alongside of you, you know, and partner up. So, you know, as we get kind of to the end here, um, tell me what it's, what it's like to, if a company is out there and they're looking for some help, you know, to grow and they want to engage your company, what is it like working with your company? Like what's a typical engagement look like? Yeah, absolutely. So we're, just as you say, we're kind of picky in that we only want to work with people we can help. Uh, and in fact, we have what we call our 10x B2B ROI growth guarantee. And right. if we can't deliver a 10x ROI for you and you know, really six months or less, we kind of will say maybe we're not the best fit. And so the way that we go about uh, sort of diagnosing that is um, we've worked with, you know, dozens of companies. And so we have really good benchmarks against these attraction systems. Like, are you attracting the right uh, opportunities? Mm -hmm. These acceleration systems, are you moving them through the sales pipeline fast enough? And then these activation systems, are you uh, activating your clients for renewals, upsells and referrals? So we'll run through a, a free diagnostic with uh, sort of prospective clients to help them identify well, where's their biggest opportunity for growth? Can we double your business in 90 days? Which is oftentimes the goal for a lot of technology companies that are on that sort yeah. of early stage growth trajectory. Uh, and then if we can identify where there's that opportunity, then we'll come up and the first step is typically to put together sort of a 90 day plan. And we can do that in an afternoon. We'll spend a couple of weeks actually auditing the existing marketing or revenue systems for prospective clients. And then uh, spend an afternoon collaboratively coming up with what's a 90 day plan that's going to lead to doubling results uh, and then give that to them and they can go from there or uh, they can, you know, sort of engage us to help implement and you know, hire, train, uh, recruit the right people to, you know, sort of build their capabilities. We, we really see ourselves as different from an agency that just sort of says, well, spend more money uh, or a, a consultant that sort of says, well, here's something, good luck, I hope it works for you. We, we tend to sort of take a little more ownership of our customer's success and really be that sort of outsourced marketing executive or marketing leadership uh, that can really take ownership of 
What's the objective for two years? So how do we break that into 90 day goals? How do we break that into two week sprints so that we're really achieving that success you're going for? Yeah, I always have my my tech clients will ask me, um, these people are offering, like, like in your case, you know, you have the, the 10X RI um, B2B growth guarantee. Um, how do they offer that guarantee? They'll ask me and I say, because they know who they're, they know exactly who their core client is. And that's who they go after is that core client because they know they can help that client. It's like a, it's like a machine. You put it, you put some input in, you get an output and it's always very consistent. And you know that that's, what's going to happen because there are variables that you can see. And yeah. And, and, and then what's good about that, in my opinion, is that if something's not hap- if it's not happening the way it normally does, something else is wrong and you have to find right. out what that something else is. So that's really that's really good advice, good sound advice to like only work with people who, you know, you're effective at working with. I mean, why as a business coach, you know, I help people who they work too many hours and they don't have good control over their team. And I teach them how to fix both of those things. But if you come to me and you're like, Hey Mike, I want to work with you. And you know, I'm working 45 hours and I want to get down to 40. That's not what I do. You know, I can't help you with that. Um, you're already there. You know, I, I would probably tell them, Whatever you've been doing, do more of it because it's going <laughs> to get you there, you know? Um, so that, that's really interesting. So why don't you let our listeners know where they can find you? Sure. Uh, so you can uh, find me on LinkedIn. I'm Remarkable Mark uh, or uh, Modern Revenue Strategies has a, a company page there or modernrevenuestrategies.com. Uh, the website where, again, uh, if you go to the slash free download, get a copy of the book uh, or feel free to just reach out to me, email Mark with a K at modernrevenuestrategies.com. Awesome. I'll make sure all those get into the description and in the, on the website, but thanks so much for your insight today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's uh, not every day that people have a kind of understanding of marketing and advertising like you do. So I really appreciate your input. Well, it was a pleasure, Mike. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much. And um, everybody, thanks for listening. And um, we'll be back again next week with another episode. <laughs>